Hi, everybody. I'm Joan Stewart, the Publicity Hound. Welcome to today's presentation on 25 killer book publishing tips from the experts. I am joined today by uh, book shepherd Judith Bryles, uh, Joel Friedlander, who is a prolific blogger, uh, book designer, template creator, <laughs> And uh, does a lot of other things, too, that he's going to share with you. Um, Amy Collins is on the line. She just joined us. And Amy is a book distributor. And she gets her clients' books into places like Barnes & Noble and Walmart and Costco and all kinds of bookstores, large and small. Also, Kelly Johnson. Hello. Kelly, hello, Amy. Kelly is a virtual assistant who has a lot of author clients. And she's worked on a lot of book launches and many, many other projects. Uh, for her author clients and she's got a lot of really neat free tools to share with you today. We are the Publishing at Sea faculty and we are going to be teaching on a working vacation for authors that we're going to tell you about later in the webinar. And what we thought we would do today, you know, we kicked around a lot of different topics and we thought, how about if we each take our five best book publishing tips and shared them. So we're each going to take, well, I mean, I'm doing the math in my head real quickly. We'll each talk for about 12 minutes, and we're going to share five tips with you. And um, about, no, oh, maybe halfway through the presentation or so, we're going to tell you about the Publishing at Sea Cruise that we're hosting in January and why you need to be on that cruise with us. Please take good notes. If you have questions, you can type them into the questions box. And panelists, while uh, one of us is speaking, if we would all mute ourselves, and you can do that just by clicking on the little telephone or the microphone to the left of your name. So, Judith, you want to kick us, kick us off? Well, why not? I, I, should ha I should share this, that my tips are kind of like... My, my favorite tips of yesterday, because I have so many tips that I actually write a weekly blog with three hot tips every, uh, every uh, uh, Friday for the Author You blog and, and three more different tips for the bookshepherd.com uh, blog. So I'm going to go up with some that really came off from a, my radio show I just finished two minutes ago. And uh, we were talking about some of the boo-boos that so many make. So I'm going to kick off right now with just the Amazon categories because everyone wonders what in the heck I'm going to do and why can't I go somewhere else. And I want to go for the Amazon bestseller list, but I'm stuck in this category. When you go on and you join the Amazon.com forward slash advantage community as a publisher and you enter in your book, um, after you enter in the ISBN and how many pages and what our price is, it's, it's going to ask you, you know, what your category is. And so you go through the laundry list and it's, it's, it's going to be extraordinarily limited. For example, let's say you have a children's book. So you click on children's and now it's going to give you another category. You get two. So maybe it drops down and it might say, you know, it might not even say middle school. It may say, um, it, it could say uh, uh, fiction or it could say, uh, you know, a fantasy, something like that. It doesn't get into the detailed depth that you want to to make it run for it. So with that set to say is what you want to go into the Amazon categories. You want to sign up for your account. The second thing what I want you to do is you go in and you create an author central account. The re reason why is that if you get into a snag, or you want to talk to a live person. This is the secret sauce. They will call you back when you click on call me. You get a call in five seconds and a real live person, not a robot, calls you. They can help you deep dive down into other categories. But here's how you find them. 
what you go into is the the category, say children's, and I started with that. Then you're go, going to go into an Am the actually Amazon page for children's, and you will start then looking on, you can stay on the left side, just visual down, and all of a sudden you'll see a huge amount of categories open up here, which will be could be from activities and crafts, it could be science, it could be uh, it, it it could be that fantasy, it could be middle school, it could be ages, you know, four to six, it could be six to eight. It it, it starts giving you the deep dive that you're looking for, and it, it it keeps going down stair step by stair step by stair step. This is where the secret sauce of the uh, uh, author central can help you because they can help you get into a category that maybe there's not a lot of competition and if your game plan is to nail down number one um, this is one way to do it and I know I have a client right now with a book launch for a middle school which is uh, called the case of the missing crown jewels and what's happened is that for the last week he has held the number one hot release on Amazon and children's just because we did this kind of exercise. And then the third part of the Amazon categories is that you want to make sure that you have the um, your categories in place. So number one is create the Amazon Advantage account. Number two, Author Central so you can have the secret sauce of talking to someone and get help. And then number three, you get into the category that will position you. Tip number one. Tip number two, is that what happens if the media approach it? Let's say you get a call from producer of Today Show and they say, oh, oh we got to have you, we got to have you, we saw your blog about this topic, or you know, maybe you're using all the secret sauce of the hashtags that show you're an expert in a certain area. And what you want to be doing is that you will, uh, do you say yes or do you say no? I will typically say, if your book is not in hand, you say no because you're not going to get back on that show. The odds of you getting back on that show, unless there's something so wild, crazy in the media that's going to pull you back in right away because they think you're just such a rock star, it ain't going to happen. Here's what you can do. If, if your ego says, oh my God, I just have to get on. They're not going to call me back. You know what? Go up to Amazon. I want you to create, get your cover, even if you change your cover, Create the account, get your cover up so you have that. Get it on your website, link your website to Amazon. Then go to, to I, I prefer Ingram Spark over CreateSpace. I would go to Ingram Spark, I would create a, a an account, and I would make a dummy book. I've got my cover, I can put it on, and even if I buy blank pages, I don't care. I can show it when I'm on TV that I have a book, links it to my website, and they're Amazon and you can do pre-orders. So that would be tip number two. Tip number three is please, please don't overstuff your front matter for your book. And I'm talking about you could have some endorsements, you could have you know the normal copyright page, you got your title page, maybe you have a half title page, maybe you have a dedication page, maybe you have an you know uh, someone's wrote it forward, then you've decided to do an introduction and then you have contents and then and then, and then, and the person who's trying to get to your book are thinking, when is it going to start? A lot of front matter could be moved to the back matter. Or I'm going to suggest this. Sometimes that introduction is so important and has such juicy stuff in it, especially for nonfiction, you might make it chapter one and get it started. And if you're doing inside the book, search inside the book with Amazon, which you should do, a lot of times when they do that random search, you're going to have all this front matter loaded up that they won't get to the content that will help sell your book. Tip number three. Tip number four is that you know it's typical to put an author page in a book. What most people don't think about is creating how to work with me. If you do consulting, like all of us do, if you do speeches, um, if you have any other online activities, any coursework that could engage them, make a separate page behind about the author, how to work with me or how to bring me to your group and write up a different type of paragraph, give them some couple of tips. Maybe you have an endorsement. You know, you were you had us rolling in the aisles, which would tell me instantly you speak with humor. That you might want to put that there. And then again, how to contact you. And please don't refer everyone just to your website. People want to pick up the phone or they want to email you instantly. So that's important. And then my last tip 
that I wanted to, to bring to you is a lot of people don't think about this, but let's say that you've got your book all done and congratulations and you you know you're having it printed and you're you know kind of up in seventh heaven and there's a couple of things you should be doing besides you know marketing and all that but here's what you want to do with your designer is that not only do you want to get the completed copy of your PDF I would ask your designer can you do a conversion back which they can it takes a little bit time so you have a clean as with all these changes in word document have that secondly I would ask so you have PDF I'd ask for the conversion and be glad to pay for it it could take depending on size half hour could take a couple hours pay for it and get it and the third part of that is ask for a copy of the uh, their actually their designer file whether it's and some won't do it most of the people I work with will and it's either in InDesign or Quark you most likely do not have this software doesn't matter what happens if your designer gets hit by a bus what happens if all of a sudden they just drop out and they they retire what happens what happens and your files those files that you've paid for that put together are now gone if you have them available and you have to switch gears somehow you can take them to transfer them to the new designer who can make added changes additions deletions whatever you want because looks do change and they've got those files so those are my five my 12 minutes are up Joan I'm ready to pass the hat this is Judith Browse, the Book Shepherd, to the next person. Okay, uh, Judith, we've got like w one or two more minutes for your segment, so I'm going to ask a couple of questions uh -huh. here. Well, wait Folks. a minute. I have, do I give another tip? <laughs> well, no, because I want to. Okay. We have a couple of right. questions that people have asked. First of all, you're all saying the slides are not advancing. I'm only seeing Judith. This is all you're supposed to see. You are only seeing the person who's presenting. The tips are not on the slides, okay? So you're going to have to take good notes or you're going to have to watch the video again, okay? Uh, Judith, do you have any specific links to these Amazon pages you're talking about or do they, do they just Google I, number what one, it is Amazon, you're for? Yes. Okay, here we go. Amazon.com forward slash advantage takes you into the pub setting up a publishing uh, page that's that's where and that's where you enter all that information to go to author central I you know I'm always on Google it's it's constantly open I just put author central in and it takes me right to it and, and I'm there and you log in and if you haven't ever done it you will just go go Amazon it's author central um, and then you you just put your login your password and here's what the beauty of this is you're building kind of a site landing page you can put images on it you can link to your blog you keep updated you're able to see how many book sales are going on it's really a good thing to do so you want to take advantage of that okay and then we have another question for you Judith can you change categories in Amazon after the book is already a couple of years old Sarah asks yes yeah. You, by the way, Sarah, you can change categories tomorrow. Um, that you're not. Uh, most people come in with a standard, and they think they're stuck, and that uh, all you have to do is then change it uh, at, at any time. And if you need help, you you click. Uh, this is the author central. You can just click on contact us, and it says, Do you want us to email you? Do we want to do an email chat, or do you want to talk on the phone? And you want to talk on the phone. They will call you in five seconds, I promise you. Five seconds. And that phone rings. Now, you may have to wait for maybe 30 seconds before the person gets on, but they connect with you, and you are queued. Okay. Uh, so Thank you, you Judith. I'm going to mute you, and I am going to unmute Joel. And Joel, you are unmuted, and you can take it away. Thank you, Joan. Can you hear me okay? I want to make sure I'm unmuted. Hello? Joan, can you hear me? Yeah, Joel, go ahead. I'm muting myself. Go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you. I've got some tips for you. And uh, my first couple of tips have nothing to do with book publishing. Hey, I'm sorry about that, but they are going to help you. They're both about blogging. 
Uh, you guys know I do a lot of blogging, and uh, blogging is great for authors. My first tip is about your about page. You know, you go to blogs, and every blogger has an about page. You know, about me, about the blog, about the blogger. But <clears throat> the problem is that most bloggers think that page is about them, and everybody takes it to be about me. And uh, so you go to author blogs, and uh, you go to the about page, which is something I do all the time. If I'm intrigued or interested or captured by your content, I want to find out more about you. And the about page is one of the best places to do that. So I go over there, and inevitably I find something like, hi, my name is Mindy, and I went to elementary school in Paducah, and then I graduated, and then I went here, and then I have two dogs, and I met a guy. You know, and... You know, you have to realize that's really not that interesting to people before they're fans of yours. So really, uh, the about page shouldn't be about you. It should be about what people have to gain from reading your blog. And if you think of it as, instead of being about me, about this blog, you'll have a much better guidance on how to put together that page. Now, it's perfectly fine to have interesting information about you on the page, what you want to do is lead off at the top with information about what you provide on the blog, who it's for, and how valuable they're going to find it. So that's tip number one. Don't make your blog's about page about you. Tip number two is also about blogging. And this is about engaging with your audience. Look, uh, you know, if you blog at all, and I bet a lot of people on this call are blogging regularly, you know, it takes a lot of work to run a blog. You've got to have an editorial schedule. You've got to attract readers. You have to market the blog. And then uh, people write beautiful blog articles, and then you read the article, and then it just ends. They're not asking you for anything. They're not asking for engagement. They're not asking for an action. So my tip is don't ever write a blog article without including some kind of call to action. And a call to action can take lots of different forms. It doesn't have to be to rise up and revolt or grab your pitchfork. A call to action would, could be, um, you know, maybe you just talked about how hard it is to sell books, and then you could ask people, uh, how are you finding it? Do you uh, have any tips or strategies you can suggest for me or other readers? Please let me know in the comments. That's a call to action. Your call to action might be, you know, please go like me on Facebook. Your call to action might be, uh, have you read my sample chapter? It's available for free. Whatever it is, you want to have some way of incentivizing people and encouraging them to actually, having read your article and maybe read it all the way through, they should now be prepared to do something. Uh, maybe refer this post to a friend. Uh, post it on social media, send a tweet about it. There are so many things you can do to ask for a call to action, and that will help people engage with you even more uh, directly. So that's a good thing. Now I've got a couple of tips for you that are about book publishing. And the first one is about print on demand. I get this question all the time. Should I use CreateSpace, or should I use Ingram Spark, or should I use Lightning Source, or Lulu, or whoever it is? You already heard Judith say that she likes Ingram Spark, and I like them too. But you know what I found for my clients is uh, that works the best is to actually set your book up both on CreateSpace and with Ingram. Whether you're an Ingram Spark publisher or a Lightning Source publisher, you, you know you can only be on one, so you have to pick one of the Ingram platforms. And the reason I do that is that if your book is with CreateSpace, your print book is with CreateSpace. Your book is going to be available for sale on Amazon 24 hours a day, seven days a week with absolutely no interruptions. If you leave your book just with Ingram, your book is, and particularly if your book starts to sell, it's going, you, what you're going to see on Amazon is it's going to go in stock and then it's going to go out of stock. When it goes out of stock, there's going to be a little note on your book sales page that the book uh, will be shipping in one to three weeks or two to four weeks. That's kind of a sales killer, don't you think? So uh, this strategy enables you to have consistent supply at Amazon all the time through CreateSpace. And then the secret tip here is when you load your book on CreateSpace, do not, repeat, do not click that box that says expanded distribution. You don't want that. 
You're going to put your book on Ingram, and they will take care of orders from the rest of the book world, everybody that's not Amazon. And that will work to your advantage because lots of bookstores will not order a book from CreateSpace. They don't have positive feelings towards Amazon. But Ingram is somebody they know and trust and has been dealing books for many, many years. So for best distribution for your print-on-demand books, put them both on CreateSpace and Ingram. You're going to use the exact same files. Your designer is going to have to adjust the cover uh, slightly because of the spine width. And you are going to use the exact same ISBN. Don't put two different ISBNs out there. It will confuse everybody. That's tip number three. Tip number four is also about book publishing, and this is about uh, ISBNs and the Books in Print database, which is a, an enormous database that's administered by Bowker. Now, you probably recognize the name Bowker because they're the same people who administer the ISBN program for the United States. So my tip is absolutely go to Bowker, go to myidentifiers.com, and open your own account there. Uh, you can put, purchase ISBNs there at their incredibly inflated rates, but, uh, you know, that's the only game in town, so that's the way it works. But the thing is, if you have your own account, you can manage your own publisher listing, and you can uh, create and manage the listings for all your titles, then that, all that information populates the books and print database. This will allow you to do things like, for instance, add an imprint if you want. If you want to publish a, a specialty books, you know, tree pruning press under your normal publishing imprint, you can just create a new imprint, have the uh, have that added to your profile at Bowker, and uh, everybody will be able to find you under that imprint. So it gives you a lot of control over what appears about you and your books online. So that's tip number four: maintain your own account at Bowker for your publisher and title listings. And my, I got to give you one book design tip, don't I? I'm the book designer. So here's my final tip, and that's if you're doing your own book formatting, make sure you stick with a standard book font. And uh, some examples might be Garamond. There are many, many versions of Garamond available. Uh, they're all pretty nice. Uh, or Caslon, another old and uh, well-regarded typeface that's never going to do you bad. It's going to make your book look good. Another one I like is Jensen. All of these fonts are available from Adobe. I kind of like the Adobe fonts. They're very high quality fonts and they have like huge uh, sets so they have all the characters you need. Uh, you're not going to get to a certain point in your document and realize you need an umlaut and there's no umlaut in the uh, character set. And the umlaut is the two little dots that sometimes appear over a letter. So um, Garamond, Caslon, Jensen, any old style typeface, uh, you might consider uh, Palatino, Minion, might be other choices. I kind of like Garamond, Caslon, Jensen for this use. So uh, this is going to help you out because, you know, it's really important that we pay attention to how readable and legible our books are. And using an uh, odd font that might look good for one line you know, can really give you eye strain over a period, you know, over 10, 20, 30, 100 pages. And you don't want that. It's not worth it. What's important about your book is the ideas in the book, not the font you use to typeset it. So my fifth and final tip is if you're doing your own book forming, formatting, stick with a standard book font like Garamond, Caslon, or Jensen. Okay, Joel. Nice, uh, nice sauce collection of a variety of tips. We have one question from Lee who would like sure. you to repeat what you should not what you should not click in Create Space. Okay, this is really, really important. If I have a slide I'd show it to you, but when you upload your book to Create Space, you have to fill out that long form. And down near the bottom they ask you about distribution. And you have to click a box to make sure that it shows up on Amazon. That's the top box in the distribution choices you have. Then there's another box that says expanded distribution. And that's the one you don't want to click. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one, I mentioned that, you know, most bookstores don't want to buy your book. 
If you click the expanded distribution, you're probably not going to be able to put your book at Ingram because the ISBN will not be allowed by Ingram, and they'll see it's already in the market. And uh, you know, the other thing is that if you sell any books through that channel through CreateSpace, you're going to take a big hit on your royalties. So to follow my plan of using both CreateSpace and Ingram, do not check the box that says expanded distribution. Okay, Joel, thank you very much. We have uh, a couple of questions, and I'm going to let the panelists answer these questions individually while we hear, thank you, Joel, while we hear from um, our next panelist, Amy Collins, who has got her five tips. Amy, you want to unmute yourself, please? How's everyone doing today? You sound great, Amy. I'm going to go ahead and mute myself, and then you can take it away. Insert joke here. All right. Everyone, my five tips do revolve mainly around marketing for sales to the end user. But the first tip that I have is about uh, an element that your book needs that will allow you to get past the gatekeepers. A catalog in publication block is a block of text on your copyright page that has a whole bunch of funny numbers and codes. It's practically hieroglyphics if you don't know the codes. But this is a block of text and numbers and codes that librarians and booksellers and university coders use to determine where your book should be shelved and where, what categories your book belong in. It is, it is prepared by librarians. They actually have to be vetted by the Library of Congress. There are a number of companies out there. Quality offers these. Uh, so does the Donahue Group. There are several companies that can create these for you. They will charge you a small fee to do so. Go make sure you check out Catalog and Publication Block and have one on your copyright page. But the tip that I have for you is the codes and what information goes on your copyright page is changing in September of 2015. September 2015, there's going to be a new set of codes going into the CIP, Catalog and Publication Block. And if you check out the Publishing at Sea or the Author U website in the next few weeks, I'm actually going to have an article to Judith Bryles about this, and you'll be able to check out at the Author U website, if you're a member, or the Publishing at Sea website, getting information as to where you can get these CIP blocks and what the changes are that are coming in September. Second tip, a number of people would like to have their books available and sold to bookstores and libraries, but they're nervous about returns. Returns are a fact of life in the publishing industry. Because back almost 100 years ago, believe it or not, when paperbacks were first coming out, excuse me, 70 years ago, when paperbacks were first becoming a big thing, the bookstores and the libraries said, we can't begin to make money on these flimsy paper things. Uh, we need you know, a nice solid hardcover. What's this awful paper you're giving us? And the book industry said, if you take our books and they don't sell, we will buy them back from you. And ever since then, the book industry has been returnable. And to get into bookstores and libraries, you need to offer a full trade discount and make your books returnable. Joel was talking about print on demand and going through create space, but not clicking the extended distribution, one of the things that happens, if you accidentally click on extended distribution, you will not be offered to the bookstores at a full trade returnable discount. You will be offered at a shorter discount. If you would like your books in bookstores and libraries, your books have to be at a full discount. Bookstores get about 40% minimum, and wholesalers get 55, and they have to be returnable. But here's a trick. If you're nervous about returns, yet you still want bookstores, make your books returnable at first. Gauge the demand and the returns for the first six months. And if and when returns are starting to get to be too much, you can shut off the returnable function. You can make your books non-returnable. Now, the books that you have already sold on a returnable basis, you have to accept back. But 
This means that your book will actually already be accepted in bookstores and libraries because you sold them on a returnable basis and you gave it a fair shot. Third tip. I'm asking you that if your book is coming out soon or if you're relaunching it in the next year, consider keeping your author photo off the back cover of your book. If you look at what HarperCollins and Random House and Penguin and the large publishing houses are doing right now and what they've been doing for a while, nonfiction authors, even nonfiction authors and fiction authors, the, the author photo is no longer on every back cover. It's actually on very few back covers. Publishers are now more and more realizing that the back cover of your book is prime real estate. It is one of the few opportunities you have to, to tell people all the benefits of your book and to intrigue them enough to open up the book and to read a few pages. Don't waste some of that prime real estate with a picture of yourself. I understand you're gorgeous. I get that. I know that, that if, even if you're a speaker, your face is your brand. There are exceptions, but for the most part, I'm asking you to consider keeping your author photo off the back of the book. Use that spot to say something even more intriguing about your book. Joel was talking about how your bio shouldn't be on and on about where you live and, and how many dogs you have. The same is true for your bio on the back of a book. Keep it short, one or two sentences. Make sure you mention where you're from. Make sure you mention the highlights if you're a nonfiction prescriptive how-to author as to your expertise. But nobody cares where you went to school for the most part. That can go on the About the Author page on the inside of the book. You keep your back cover and that prime real estate focused on the benefits of the book. Or if it's fiction, focus your time and energy in that prime real estate on intriguing people about the, the plot of your book and draw them in. Fourth tip, it is possible to, do, to be all things to all people, but it's not usually a good idea. Launching your book to the bookstore market and the library market and on Amazon and to universities and to associations and to schools all in the first six months is exhausting and it will allow you very little deep diving into any segment of the market. I am suggesting that you launch your book into one segment of the market at a time. So decide what is most important to you. Are you a prescriptive how-to nonfiction author? Have you written a book about personal finance? Or have you written a book that's perfect for college kids? Find your key market. Is it online? going towards the college kids or their parents during graduation season. Perhaps your key market should be associations because you've written a book for certified financial planners and you want to go after all the CFPs in the country. Pick one segment of the market and for 90 to 120 days dive deep into that segment of the market and then move relaunch your marketing efforts to the bookstore marketplace. After 90 to 120 days relaunch your book and focus on the library market. Really, I'm, I'm strongly suggesting that you really focus on one segment of the marketplace at a time. The exception to this advice would be if you have a large staff of people at your disposal or you have more money than I do and you can afford to hire 15 people to handle all the different elements, then ignore tip number four. But my tip number four is to consider perhaps diving deep into each segment of your marketplace at 90 degree elements and rotating them. You're going to keep promoting to these parts of the marketplace for years. Joan Stewart was, was making us all laugh on the cruise last January. She, you know, she keeps being asked, how long do I have to promote my book? And the answer is, well, how long do you want to sell it? And I loved that. And my fifth tip, is I would like to suggest that everyone out there, whether it's a nonfiction or a fiction author, that everyone out there consider offering a portion of the proceeds of your books to, a, as a donation to an organization that you believe in. I would also suggest offering a portion of your book print run for fundraisers. Using your book for fundraisers and using your book for good is not only a nice thing to do, it really helps with what I have started calling karmic marketing. 
getting the word out there to organizations that you believe allows you to do good for your community, but it also allows you to piggyback off of their branding and perhaps their newsletter and their, their members will hear about your book in a manner that they would not have if you had not partnered with this organization. Find a dog rescue organization. Go after a local United Way sponsored group. I don't care what, what cause is important to you. What I care about is that you pay attention to karmic marketing. I'm, I'm very excited about this idea. We've just really started launching it with my clients lately and it's working. I would ask you to consider always putting a portion of your proceeds and of your books to fundraisers and towards donations. And those are my five tips. Okay, Amy, we have a couple of questions here for you. Um, let's see here. Um, who gets a 55% discount, Stacy is asking. Ingram, Baker and Taylor, Brodart, Bookazine, any of the wholesalers whose job it is to stock your books and hold them until bookstores order them, because bookstores will purchase the books from those wholesalers at a 40 to 45 percent discount, and the wholesalers will keep the 10 to 12, 15 percent difference uh, at, for their cut of for their purposes and for what they did in the process. Okay, um, and then. Someone else asks, um, what were the two websites you mentioned for the catalog in publishing? Sure, it's catalog in publication block and Donahue Group, which is dgi-pcip.com and the other one is unique books.com and both of those links I am going to make sure that Judith puts up on her blog uh, at author you but the Donahue group and unique books those are the two that I use the most frequently and there are others feel free to google them but those are the two that I recommend okay and Kaya has a question here um, CIP she says can't get CIP when self-published do you have to get a PCN? Okay, um, there, uh, you're a there is a little confusion. I'm not talking about a Library of Congress number. A Library of Congress number is only available to publishers who have four books by at least three different authors. She's absolutely right about that. A PCN, which is a pre-control number, is available to anyone, even if you're only publishing one book. A catalog and publication block a CIP block is different from a Library of Congress number and you can get one even as a self-publisher. You have to go through one of these third party, third parties that are licensed by the Library of Congress, but it is absolutely possible to use a third party to get this block. The Library of Congress will not give you one unless you're a publisher with four books by three different authors, but you can get one from a third party provider that has been licensed by the Library of Congress. Okay, and then we have another question here from Joanne. She says, what if you are publishing in September, October of 2015 regarding the CIP? She says, I already have a CIP for my book. Do I change it now? You don't have to change it now. The new rules are going into effect in September, but they are giving two, there's a two-year grandfathering phase in that's going to happen between 2015 and 2017, there is nothing to worry about. By the time your next edition of your book comes out, you can put the new sorts of codes onto that one. Okay. Um, we also have a question here from someone um, who uh, wants some tips on how to get in books into bookstores or the library and I told her this is a whole webinar all its own this yeah. topic so at the end Amy I may come back to you if we've got some time left and if you want to just give some general tips at the end about how to get books into bookstores and maybe the library um, I think everybody might be interested in hearing about that but for the time being we want to move on okay that sounds fair but I would like to mention that we are covering that on the cruise in depth there will be at least three hours on how to get your books into bookstores, libraries, associations, and that yes, we can talk about it later if you want, but also 
it's going to be heavily covered on the cruise step by step. Okay, and that's a great segue into the next portion. So, Amy, thank you. I'm going to, uh, you've muted yourself. Thank you. And, Judith, if you want to unmute yourself, you are now unmuted. And we want to tell you what we are doing in January. We are going on the third annual Publishing at Sea cruise to this time to the Western Caribbean. We're going to be sailing out of Fort Lauderdale on January 24th and we are going to be spending, I think it comes to seven nights on the beautiful Allure of the Seas which is Royal Caribbean's largest ship in the fleet. We had this ship last year and it was an absolute blast. There are actually seven <laughs> neighborhoods on this ship. For example, they have Central Park on this ship with real live trees growing and little cafes where you can eat. And it's wonderful. And it is, it's the working vacation. It, it's just a working vacation that I think every author should take advantage of because it's a great investment in your publishing career. So Judith, you want to tell us a little bit about the cruise? I will. And, you know, let me add another nice adjective word to this. It's a working tax deductible vacation because this, your, your publishing is a business. This is what you're going to learn. You're going to have a lot of hours from us. So you are getting an education and there are codes. It, the code says that your transportation of getting to and from classes, the fact that you have to fly, and get on a boat, um, that's part of it. So with that said, the, the, uh, we were well taken care of. And I think one of the things that was very exciting from, uh, we had an email not too long ago from one of our attendees from our first cruise that was able to break through and actually get picked up by several uh, on several items that she learned within the cruise where there are more academic books um, which is not usually who we get as our attendees, but that was their market, and they were able to run with it with ideas they picked up. And we've had several people publish after they have attended, and I think what's great is that with the attendees, and then it, that's incorporated, it's such a good environment to learn and, sh and, and schmooze with authors who are beginners in some cases, some ha are really well in depth with their book and the process of it, and some have books in hand and now they want to know how to get those books in the library, so they'll be hanging on to every word that Amy will be sharing in the segments that she gives. But the, the line is excellent, the, the items within the uh, on the cruise and what we're going to be covering that will incorporate all our expertise, that it will just bring so much to the breadth of what you're doing and you will get one-on-one -on -one time with us. You will have, uh, we, we really strongly feel that when we're in port, we want you to go play. You play hard and you have a great time. We'll see you back at dinner time and we'll just hear about your day. But when we're at sea, we're going to work you. And we're going to start working you at 8.30 in the morning. We will let you take a lunch break at noon to 3 so you can enjoy the sun. And after all, being in the Caribbean in January is not a bad place to be. And then we will see you back for another two-hour segment before we let you go to get ready for dinner. Dinner will be at 6. And then there are just amazing variety of activities on board where it's comedy shows, there's jazz. If you're a karaoke person, by golly, you can test your lungs and um, voice. There, there is a major stage shows that you can get into. They're all free. And, and one of the things that's great about the cruise itself is that basically those activities are included in your fee. The only thing that is not is that if you like to drink, you get to pay for that on your own. So how's that sound, Joan? That sounds fabulous, and we need to tell them also about the shore excursions. Um, I did. We there are various shores ex shore excursions that you can sign up for, and each excursion has its own fee. Um, and you can find out more about that 
right on the Royal Caribbean website. Um, in Cozumel, for example, the Mayan ruins are, I have heard, are spectacular. I did not go on this cruise, I mean, on this excursion last time. But Judith, you heard that they may be ending this soon, is that right? Yeah, they, there is really buzz going on, Joan, that there's a, a possibility, and I would say it's, probably, it's, it's certainly a probability. I mean, they get worn down, people climbing up and down and all around, and it is on my hit list. If I don't do this um, if, if I don't do this one within the next six months, you know, I, I'm concerned. So I'm going to be doing it. I am also on one of our next slots, and in, in the beaches are lovely in Cozumel, and I know that you found the, the doggy dish you've been looking for for months. Yeah, exactly. And a cool doggy t-shirt. And uh, there are also all kinds of other cool excursions. There's, um, there's a zip line, as you can see right here, there's a zip line right into the bay in Haiti. And we did zip lining last year. <laughs> Well, that wasn't cruise. really zip lining. What Joan and I, Joan and I ended up going on was a full-blown army obstacle course. Yeah, right. It was not <laughs> zip lining. This, this is more of a zip lining. But I will tell you, in Jamaica, there is a fabulous zip line course. If you really want to get into the jungles and the trees, you want to do Jamaica. This is more of a touristy thing, but they have some really nice. Uh, th this is what you're seeing here is a, a Haiti. Uh, the Haiti Lagoon, the, the shore, and that there are some just really beautiful, uh, beautiful, beautiful little beaches just to cozy in that are available to you. And then there is also, um, instead of a junky type of shopping center, they have really have a fabulous little village that I enjoyed last time I was through. Yeah, and I, I just like, I like getting off the ship and just, you know, staying, right, you know, in the general area of the ship and just, you know, going to the touristy places, and I got some really cool stuff last year, and, and if you don't want to get off, you can stay on the ship, because, you know, a lot of people have left, you know, so there, <laughs> there are not a lot of people left on the ship on, on shore excursion days. You can pretty much do whatever you want to do, and the excursions um, are really a lot of fun. Most you know, of the people... Let me, let me add to that, that if you have been on cruise, like, I have done a lot of cruises and there are times that I really do stay on board and let me tell you a secret about this. The spa days, that the spa activities and a lot of the shipborne activities that do have a cost factor, like if you're doing a massage there's a cost to it, but they actually have half price deals on shore days. So if you're someone who wants to enjoy the beauty of the ship and it's a gorgeous ship and you want to have quiet time. Um, this may be your day, and you can get a hot stone massage and all those goody things for much of your teeth whitened. I mean, let me tell you, you can do the full body works um, during this time at a reduced rate. And there's also one of the excursions I really want to do in January, and we had somebody in our group do it last year. Uh, the ship has an, an excursion of the ship. They'll take you on a tour of the, the bowels of the ship where you can go actually into the kitchen and watch this four-level kitchen in action feed. What is it, 6,000 people on the ship or something? I don't know. It's a lot of people. Yes. And how yes. they do the meals and how they, you know, the whole operation on how they serve this many people. They just see they have like a million-dollar washing machine that washes all of the, the linens and the sheets and all of that. And they came back and just delighted us over dinner one evening um, on that. And so that's the one I want to do in January. But I'd be remiss you know, if, we, if we didn't talk about January in Jamaica too. <laughs> right. And, and then the other thing is I think it's important for people who have uh, food sensitivities. The ship goes out of the way to help you out. Like I have some severe allergies to a few herbs. Every night, everyone watched this, they brought me the menus for the next night so I could select what I wanted and they made sure they were prepared separately to protect me. I mean, how cool is that? And I should also say that last year, a couple of our people um, had some health issues, and they were in the infirmary, and they were taken care of spectacularly. Uh, so it, it's good to know that you can get away, and if you need some help, it's available to you. And here we are.
this is our first cruise, the class of 2014. I think there are a couple of us that didn't make it for this particular picture. We took it right before right. dinner. And what we do is we all eat together. We, we, our group is assigned what, you know, three or four tables. And it's fun because we all sort of sit with different people every night. And it's just, it's so much fun getting to know each other and to talk about our projects and, you know, sit poolside with somebody, I had a couple authors who wanted a, you know, wanted publicity tips. I said, yeah, let's go sit by the pool, you know, in the afternoon. I'd be happy to talk with you. So you get one-on-one -on -one time with us. We have an absolute blast, and I, I can't think of a better group of people I'd rather vacation with than authors because they're, they're all so interesting. Their backgrounds are interesting, their topics are interesting, and they're a heck of a lot of fun. So Judith, do you want to go over the particulars of the cost? I would love to, and here's what you need to understand, that the, the cost factors as we come into play, we're quoting $16.95, and that's through midnight June 30th, and the price is on July 1st will go up $300. This price is per person, so $16.95 per person. There is two people in the cabin. If you choose to have a cabin all by yourself, it is $25.95. So what you don't have to pay for is the taxes on the second person, and you don't have to pay for the gratuities. And what's included in this $16.95 price is all taxes, and we prepay all tips, so you're not going to have to monkey around with any of that. And then if you bring someone with you who does not attend, they just want to play on the ship, then the price is $31.95. So that is for you um, and as attendee, although if you've got someone who's in your life, partner, spouse, whoever it is, and they really are going to be a factor of your marketing and some of the things you're going to do, I would do everything I could to get them to sign up to participate as a full-blown attendee because that they may be the perfect note taker. I mean, there's a lot of work. You're going to get a full-fledged three-ring binder with all our handouts, all our items, everything in there to explain what you have. So you have a great takeaway because this is a workshop. Think of this as a workshop, not just a lecture. This is a workshop. So $16.95, $25.95 if you want your own cabin, or if you're going to share a cabin with someone attending, it's $31.95. For two of you, it'll be $16.95 times two. Now, if you're someone who thinks that, you know what, I'm just going to book this myself, and I'll let you know, and these are all balcony cabins, ocean view balcony cabins. If you're just going to, uh, I'm going to do it myself, well, we'll let you do that but you're going to pay an extra 495 for the workshop. And if you were to go online and price it out, I can tell you, you would be paying a heck of a lot more than this because if you pay the taxes and the things that came in, you would have over $220. You'd be paying over $90 of gratuities. And the base of your cruise would be $1,230 for our category, which is a total of $1,541. If you added in $495 for your workshop, you know that you're a lot over this. So it's a heck of a deal. You'd have an incredible time. You'll have memories. Plus, the really great thing is that you are on the road to being really seriously successful with your publishing, which is the goal of the five of us. And it, we should also mention, too, Judith, that some people might be wondering, what about my kids? I might want to bring my kids with me. There are there is so much for kids to do on this ship. There is a hand-carved carousel. There's an old-fashioned hot dog stand. There are craft workshops. There's a, there's a climbing wall. There's all kinds of cool stuff for kids. So if you want to make a family vacation out of it and your spouse and the kids can go off while, you're, while you are learning how to be a great author and publisher, that's another way that you can do it. So Judith, um, I've got your phone number here on the slide and Here's if people the, yeah. um, are on maybe the fence about this or they're not quite sure if this cruise is for them or if they've got any questions, your phone number is right up here at the top. Exactly. Here's what I want you to do because I mean you could go ahead and register but I'd rather talk with you 
and um, and because you right now you only have to put a deposit down for three hundred dollars per person, and then you put the next amount up in on August first, and the final balance will be a few months later. Um, I call me at three oh three, and that's Mountain Time, three oh three eight eight five two two oh seven. 303-885-2207 or text me and just say I'm really interested call me all right and I will call you back uh, by tomorrow morning you will have a call from me and that or you can email me at Judith at Bryles B R I L E S and just say I'm interested or I'm in whatever you want I will get back to you to get you set up and covered and I will tell you all we are almost sold out we are almost sold out so if you want to join Joel and Amy and Joan and Kelly and myself and have the time of your life as well as a learning experience of your publishing life you want to be there January 24th through the 31st. And we have a question from Billy and Billy asks what if there is one attendee and you are bringing two non-attendees? Well first of all the cabins are set up for two in a cabin and you're gonna have to talk to me because I'll get I have to get a pricing and pause and move you to another room so I've got to see what it's available because they're designed for two um, it, there, some of them have a pull-out couch in them. If you want to put a child in it, I would not recommend that for some of the, the uh, for some of the adults out there. So that would be Billy. That would be something where you would send me an email now or text me and say, "Call me so we can talk." And I have to go to work as the group coordinator here and see what I can pull together for you. Okay. And Karima says, "I've never been on a ship." You make me excited about that journey. Karima, I got to tell you, um, I would never, ever have gone on a cruise in my entire life because this was something that I just did never appeal to me. It's not something I would want to do on vacation. And when Judith approached me three years ago to join them on the first cruise, I thought, yeah, yeah, I'll go. I was bowled over and I <laughs> I am I'm sold on cruises I am like so there already I'm so excited by seeing these slides and by talking about it because you are pampered beyond belief by Royal Caribbean they are fabulous and um, the food is great the shopping is great um, you're getting you know the tips that you're hearing today is just a tiny slice of what you're gonna learn on this wonderful tax deductible working vacation so if you think if you think you're excited now wait until you get your first sight of that huge ship I my jaw dropped when I saw it it's really a lot of fun okay Judith any closing words before we hear from Kelly we'd love to have you join us um, call us and we get we guarantee a good time and that the Caribbean is usually fairly mellow during these this time of the year so you don't need to worry most of you will not have a problem with seasickness but um, we will communicate with you some of the alternatives just in case from the little patches behind the ear from the little wristbands from the infamous pills um, and so, you know, we handle, <laughs> we'll handle all that for you. I mean, I can't prevent it, but I will give you one tip is don't stop eating if you're ever seasick. One of the tips to do is keep a little bit going down all the time. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, Judith, if you would mute yourself. Kelly, I'm going to unmute you, and I'm going to mute myself, and I'm going to advance the slide. Kelly, um, along with Joel, is a new um, faculty member this year and Kelly why don't you share with us some tips that you are going to be going into in more detail on the cruise take it away it's all yours Oh, wonderful thank you so much Joan and uh, Karima I'm with you this is actually going to be my first time on a cruise ship as well and thank you that you shared Joan that when you first joined the faculty it was your first time so I, I can't wait I'm excited too to get that experience as well in addition to being honored to join the faculty so yeah I know we're all getting excited <laughs> uh, but a lot of you may uh, know if you um, if you're familiar with me or if you had a chance to learn about my connection with author you that I proudly wear the title of resident geek girl so I always love trying to come up with some 
you know, tools that I can share, um, some free and low-cost online services that can help you as you're writing your book, as you're preparing, and also just for your business, because we all have so many options out there. And as you know, technology is constantly changing. It can get a little overwhelming to try to determine what might be good, or should I try this, or maybe should I go for that, or where do I even start? So I just wanted to share um, today on the webinar a couple of um, some tips of some online services that are free or low cost that I think might be a good place for you to start as you're um, working on your book and then getting ready to join us on the cruise. So the first one that I wanted to share with you, it's actually called Pictacular. And the website, it's P-I-C-T. A C U L A R dot C O. So not spectacular dot com, it's spectacular dot C O. And this is a free service. It actually allows users, you can share your Instagram pictures on your Pinterest account. That's one of the things I love about this free um, spectacular service because I want to help uh, you know, authors be able to find ways to repurpose all that great content you have and not always feel like you have to come up with something new every time. So we want to see what you've already got, how can you repurpose it and share it on different platforms. So Pictacular will allow you to take those great images you're sharing on Instagram and then repost it um, to your Pinterest. The other thing I really like about Pictacular is that when you're logged on and looking at your account on your computer, it actually will arrange it and it looks very similar to how you would view your Pinterest account where it shows the different you know, boxes for your boards. It does the same thing on Pictacular for all of your Instagram pictures. So it makes it easier to view and see what you want to share or make edits on. So that is the first tip that I have is Pictacular. And as a little bonus with that, on your um, smartphones, if you want to also try out another cool app, it's called Flipagram. So F-L-I-P-A-G-R-A-M. Flipagram, and it actually lets you create quick little videos from your Instagram pictures. So you can have a little fun playing with that. <laughs> um, the second tip that I wanted to share is, especially since a lot of us heard that you know Google was making that change with its algorithms and making sure that your websites are mobile friendly and that you're meeting all of those requirements. And a lot of times, whether we're just starting to create our websites, or we've had a website for a while and we're kind of wondering, should we refresh anything? Should we make some updates? What exactly should I change? And we want to be respectful of time and budgets as well, because I certainly understand that making major changes can take a lot of time, and we want to be uh, cautious, too, of our budgets. So these two um, websites I'm about to give you, they're free, and they're website review and SEO tools. And SEO stands for Search Engine Optimization. So they're great ways to go ahead and put in your website URL, and it will just give you all of this information for free on, is your website mobile friendly? If not, it'll give you maybe some tips on how you can make it mobile friendly. It'll give you some suggestions like keywords. Are you using keywords well? Um, looking at, do you have a way to collect you know, a, an opt-in box? Are you collecting names and emails? Um, looking at even your images, are you optimizing your images and putting in some keywords and keyword phrases there? So it really breaks down each area in different places you can look at to focus on where you might want to make some changes or make some updates. So those two sites, the first one is called WooRank, and that is W-O-O-R-A-N-K dot com, so WooRank.com. And the other one is Marketing Greater, and that's marketinggreater.com. Could you spell so, that, please? Yeah, could you? Oh, yes. Sorry, I was just about to. <laughs> so M-A-R-K-E-T-I-N-G-G-R-A-D as in David, E-R.com. So WooRank.com and marketinggreater.com. And once again, both of those are free. And you know, feel free to start with one. Look at all of the suggestions of what they you know, break down for you and show you, you know, yes, this is places you're doing great on what you have optimized on your website. You're doing well. And here's some suggestions for improvement. And then go to the second one. And once again, just even maybe compare and see other suggestions that that other service is offering. So it just gives you a great place to start for that. The third tip I wanted to offer is called time trade. 
and I believe Joan, you might also you're familiar with this site as well. Um, Time Trade it's an online appointment scheduling service. Now this one does have a free 30 day trial, so you can try it out and see if you like the service. But the um, great thing is, even though there's a cost if you want to go ahead and make the purchase and use it after the 30 day free trial, it's only forty nine dollars for the whole year. So it's a very cost effective tool and. What it allows you to do is, as I shared, it's an online appointment scheduling service. And it, th what the way that they describe it in Time Trade is you can go ahead and create as many different activities that you want. And an activity, an example of that would be like a 30-minute consultation call you know, with you. A, 60, a second activity um, would be a 60-minute consultation call with you. you know, another one might be, um, a 45-minute you know, website review if that's a service that you offer. So you create each of those as an activity and what it does in time trade is it will generate a link that you can either email to people, you can post it on your website. So it's a nice way where in time trade for each of those activities you can indicate what your availability is. It will show you know, for your 30-minute consultation sessions for example you want to conduct those on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays you know, at 10, 12, and 2. You can mark that in there so that when people click on that link, they can see what your availability is. They'll mark the one that matches the open availability in their calendar. And you can create a nice welcome message. It'll show if they need to provide a phone number or if you can give a phone number that they need to call you at that date and time. Um, and it will also send them a reminder notice. Um, you can have it scheduled. Usually it'll be you know, 24 hours before that scheduled date and time that they selected. So it's a really nice way and a very cost effective way that if you want to help just manage you know, some of the scheduling that you're doing and ways to be able to confirm things, whether you want it to be for free, you know, people don't have to pay you for that time to get that consultation session, or if there is something that you want them to pay for, like say that 45-minute website review, you could have it set up, you know, either your virtual assistant or your web designer, you know, put the pay, payment button on your website, they click that, make their payment, and then in your autoresponder message that they get after payment's been submitted, you could have that time trade link in that autoresponder message that they click and go ahead and handle scheduling. So it helps to save time for you so you're not also having to follow up with everyone and have, you know, make sure that they're getting all of these dates and times and you're having several emails go back and forth. <laughs> so a great way to save some time as well. So that was time trade. The fourth one that I wanted to share for you is just some tips about um, five elements to create a really powerful YouTube channel. Um, YouTube, in case some of you might not be aware of this, it's actually the second most popular search engine behind Google. And you can probably guess who owns YouTube. Google. <laughs> so because YouTube is the second most popular search engine, we want to help also make sure that you're utilizing and optimizing you know, a YouTube channel that you create. Either you already have it created or you will be creating one because um, this is some of the area with YouTube I'll specifically be going over on the cruise. Um, we want to find different ways to make sure that you're really optimizing and utilizing your YouTube channel you know, to the best of your ability. So here's five elements for you to start looking at how you can create a powerful YouTube channel. Now, a YouTube channel is something that you automatically get when you sign up for your YouTube account. And what your channel is, is it basically gives you a place that you can have a customized branded header. And it just has a place where it lists all of the videos that you've uploaded and that you're sharing through YouTube. So the first element is what I just referred to. Make sure at the very top of your channel, you have a branded header image. So once again, either if you know how to create one, you could use a, a free service like canva.com, C-A-N-V-A.com, or if there's a graphic designer that can help you create that, make sure that your branded header image is right uploaded at the top of your YouTube channel. The second element to have a powerful YouTube channel is make sure to include the links to your site. Um, up at the top in your branded header image, in the lower right, there's little icons for Pinterest, Facebook, your website, your blog, LinkedIn. Make sure to go ahead and put all of the URLs for each of your social media accounts and your website and your blog up there. That's a great way for people to learn more about you and drive traffic to your sites. 
The third element is make sure in the description about your channel, basically what you're saying overall, this is what I do and these are what my videos in general are about that you'll see on my YouTube channel. Make sure you have keywords included or keyword phrases in your description channel. It's another great way, especially with YouTube being the second most popular search engine, to really increase your online presence. The fourth element in a powerful YouTube channel is you can select any one of the videos you've uploaded as your channel trailer. So this is a great place, especially as your book is coming out and you have a book trailer video. That can be, you can make your channel trailer, that book trailer video is the first video that they'll see when they view your YouTube channel. So that's a great way to promote your book or if there's a new service or program that you're offering. Once again, you can always change out which your channel, which video is showing as your channel trailer. And so you can just think about what is it you really want to highlight at that time and make that be the channel trailer video. And then the fifth element is you can actually create different playlists on your YouTube channel. So for example, let's say you have 10 videos in total at the moment uploaded to your YouTube channel. And let's say three of those videos are about you know, how to market your book. Um, three other videos might be about uh, you know, book, best book publishing tips. You can create playlists and have those you know, all categorized in their appropriate areas together. And once again, use keyword and keyword phrases because that will also help to increase not only your online presence, but it makes it easy for those site visitors to find your information and see all the different areas that you have an expertise in what you're discussing. So those are the five elements just to help you have a really powerful YouTube channel. And then the last tip that I wanted to share, this one is called Q Prompter. So that's C-U-E-P-R-O-M-P-T-E-R.com. So prompter as in like a teleprompter. And that's exactly what this QPrompter.com free service does. Basically, what you do is you just go to QPrompter.com, and you'll see on your screen, it actually pops up where you can copy and paste text that you have, and it will you can put the speed of how fast or slow you want it to scroll your text up, um, what kind of size font, if you want a black background and white text or a white background with black text, and it gives you a little bit of those options. So you can have a free teleprompter just right on your computer screen and this is especially helpful when you want to record anything. For example, let's say your audiobook and you don't want to have that rustling of paper in the background or hear that you're turning pages, or just any recording that you're doing, an audio recording, and you don't want to have a lot of that background noise. That Q prompter is a great free tool that just lets you have your text right there. It keeps your focus up so your head's not down, so you're not projecting into your desk you know, or into the table surface. It helps keep you eye level, so in case you do have a camera and you're video recording yourself, you can have that right there visually up above too, and you don't have to worry that you're constantly looking up and down at your you know, paper text. You've got it right there on your computer screen. So that is the uh, last tip that I have, and I believe then my, that fits my time period for the tip. Great tips, Kelly. I can't wait to join you on the cruise. I want to hear about all... I, you know, usually I know about all the <laughs> all these tools, <laughs> and uh, one or two of them I've heard of, but most of these I've never heard of before, and I can't wait to go investigate them, and I especially can't wait to join you on the cruise to see what else you've got up your sleeve well, that I don't know that's about. That's one of the things I'm so excited, too, about being a part of this faculty is I love that we're not only able to share this information with the participants, but truly, as you just pointed out, Joan, I feel so fortunate I get to learn from all the inst other instructors as well because it's great that we can share this knowledge. You know, I on the cruise, um, both lit this past January and the January before, I left both cruises with a, um, a I use a moleskin, with a moleskin full, just packed with notes. And I did a debriefing coming back on the plane and I, I do this big to-do list and I prioritize my to-do. So I learn as much from the other speakers and even from some of the other authors. Um, you know, I learn, you know, 20 times more than what I present. So um, I can't wait to be with you in January. Thank you. I'm excited too. <laughs> All right. And 
I have got a couple of tricks up my sleeve too. Um, some things, some tips that I want to share with you. And the first one is, um, authors, please, before you write anything, before you write your book, before you create your marketing materials, before you upload your book to Amazon before you go out to try to get publicity. Please define the target market for your book. I spoke to a group last weekend and we did a hot seat in the front of the room and one of the speakers asked if people could help him identify the target market for his book. And you know when I hear that my heart breaks. If, you're, if you don't know who your target market is for your book, how do you know who to write to? How do you know what kind of publicity to go after? How do you know how to direct your sales copy? Um, and I, what I advise people to do is to envision someone from your target market. And I want you to sit down either with a box of crayons or some colored pencils or some um, magic markers or something. And I want you to draw a picture of, the, of, an, of a person from your ideal target market, okay? And I want you to you know, think to yourself, how much money do they make? Um, are they, do they have an educational degree? Or might they have gone to a trade school? What part of the country do they live in? What kind of hobbies do they like? Um, what, what's their job title? And draw a little avatar of someone in your ideal target market and come up with a very detailed definition of what that person is like and take it and tape it to your wall or pin it to your uh, bulletin board and when you are writing your book, when you're writing marketing material, write for that person because if you don't know who your target market is, you're not going to have a clue where to find those people online. So that is sort of segues into my second tip, and that is, and I hear this all the time, all of the, the faculty members hear this from authors. Well, I built a website, or I have these books on Amazon, and I'm not getting any traffic, and so therefore I'm not selling any books. You can't build a website and put books on Amazon and wait for the traffic to come to you. That is not going to happen. What you need to do is, once you have the profile of your target market, you need to go onto the internet and you need to find those people and they are all over the internet. And let me give you a couple of suggestions of places to find them. Goodreads, G-O-O-D-R-E-A-D-S.com, Goodreads.com is the world's largest book review and book recommendation site. And it's not just for authors, it's for readers who are looking for recommendations from other readers on books to read. And there are thousands and thousands of special interest reading groups, like almost little book clubs, on Goodreads. And if you, you ought to be over there looking for your ideal target market, joining a group, interacting with them, sharing the books that are on your digital bookshelf. You can create your own little digital bookshelf right on Goodreads. And Goodreads also has an author marketing program that has nine or ten ways that you can actually use Goodreads. And I think almost all of them are free things that you can do to market your book. And Goodreads is just one of many, many book review and book recommendation sites. So Google it. Google book review and book recommendation sites and you'll find lots of them. Tip number three, promote your expertise before you promote your book. It is so easy to publish right now because of all the free online publishing tools that there's an author under every single rock. Today we're all authors. There, there are millions of us, millions of us out there publishing books, either print books or ebooks, and we are all competing with each other for people's time, 
attention, and money. Separate yourself from all the other author, authors in your genre out there by promoting your, by becoming an expert and promoting your expertise. And I'm going to be teaching an entire workshop on this topic on the cruise on how to become an expert. And expertise is not only about what's in your head, about what you know about a particular topic. It's what you do with that expertise. What, what are some of the things that experts do? Well, experts teach, like the faculty members on the line today, we're all going to be teaching on the cruise. I teach webinars as part of my business. I do live in-person training. Um, experts publish books. They create products. Some of them create physical products or info products. Some experts serve as expert witnesses. They write white papers. They are sought after by the media, and they share their expertise with media people. What are some other things that experts do? They have um, mentoring programs. Experts are coaches. They have membership programs, so they're taking that expertise and they're sharing it with the world a whole lot of different ways by doing things. And I know what your fiction authors are wondering. What about me? I write, um, you know, I write fiction. I write Civil War romance novels. Well, I would think that if you write Civil War romance novels, you probably did a lot of research on the Civil War so that you can make sure that your that the fiction you're writing is historically accurate. You can promote yourself as a Civil War expert. And an expert doesn't mean you're the person in the, in the world who knows the most about that topic. It just means you know more about that topic than most other people do. So come on on the cruise in January and learn how to become an expert in your topic, even if you write fiction. Tip number four, and I'm going to spell out this website for you. A lot of people ask me, um, what do I do if I want publicity but I can't afford those big media directories that cost a couple thousand dollars? There is a fabulous online media contact directory for media outlets in the United States that include daily, daily newspapers, weekly newspapers, college newspapers, TV stations, and radio stations. And it's usnpl.com, and I'm going to spell it out for you. It's U as in United, S as in States, N as in Newspapers, P as in Publicity, and L as in List, USNPL. Dot com is a free media database, really. And, I mean, if you want to pay them money to download a particular type of list, you can do that. But I haven't spent any money over there, and I use that, that database all the time to find contact information for um, journalists and broadcasters and talk show hosts and, and college newspaper editors and and it's all searchable by state. And I got this tip from a publicist who I work with, and it's fabulous. Tip number five. I will bet that at least one-third of the people who are listening to this webinar right now are using for business purposes email addresses that are associated with AOL, Hotmail, Yahoo, Comcast, Roadrunner, and even Gmail. And when I see this, this also breaks my heart because what has AOL done for you lately? Why are you branding AOL and Comcast and Yahoo and Hotmail in your email address? An email address is something that you own. It's a tool that you have that you ought to be branding your own domain name. And if you don't have a website yet, go buy a domain name and make it part of your email address. And get rid of those cheesy Hotmail and Yahoo 
addresses because once you start to go out there in the marketplace and after you've published your book, it just, I don't know, it just, it just looks unprofessional to use those kinds of email addresses, especially when you're out there pitching reviewers and you're pitching journalists and you're trying to get on radio talk show hosts and maybe you're either, maybe you're even going after a major publisher. Maybe you want a major publisher to publish your book. So those are my five tips. You now have 25 tips in all. And Judith, do you have any closing words for us before we wrap it up for this evening? We, we may have, to, we've got about five minutes left for a couple of questions. Um, JP asks, how does a fiction author promote expertise? You find out what the topic of your fiction is about. What's your fiction about? What's the topic? Go learn as much as you possibly can about that topic and then do things with that expertise. You can write white papers. You can publish articles to LinkedIn. I'm going to be doing um, an entire session on the cruise on how to use LinkedIn to find readers, reviewers, publishers, influencers, anybody who needs to know about your book. All right, so Joan, what I would add into that is that it really is important to get that expertise level and the fiction writers need to really understand that they are experts in a variety of areas. I always like to use Tom Clancy as an example. After 9-11 hit, who did all the media have on as the terrorism expert? Tom Clancy, fiction writer. So um, label it and run with it. There's a couple of the questions I'd like to see us answer. And uh, Amy, maybe Amy, you know this one. I'm not familiar with Mill City Press Press's expanded distribution. Do you know anything about it? Yes. Uh, well, I know Mill City Press. They're a good. They're a, a, a good outlet. Their expanded distribution is exactly the same as the expanded distribution offered by CreateSpace, meaning they use Lightning Source for the expanded distribution, which means that if you if you go through them, you need to clarify with them that you'll be at the full 55% trade discount and returnable. Mill City is a great outfit, but I'm not as familiar with what terms they offer, but I do know their expanded distribution uses Ingram, Spark, and Lightning Source, just like Joel was talking about the CreateSpace does. Okay. And then Frank wanted to know, is there any time of year that, that is good or bad for launch parties? <laughs> and my attitude is there's never a bad time, uh, but that you do want to be sensitive. Some, it, it depends on how you're going to launch. If you're doing a full-blown publicity launch where you're really pushing it out to anyone and everyone, or if you're, are you doing a soft launch to get people on board, you're after reviews and you want to do that and then you're going to go full bore. So I think it's very important to be tuned in to what's going on in the media. Um, if there is something, if there is a crisis going on, I would pull it back in a nanosecond. You can't compete with that. But that almost any time of the year is good but you need to make sure that your 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 launching it might be appropriate. Like if you're doing something that is all summery and you're doing it in the winter, it might not work. But Amy, you want to add to that? Just that a launch party uh, can be held at a restaurant, it could be held at a bookstore, yeah. it could be held at a number of different venues, and that it means different things to different people. If you're going to use a retail establishment for your launch party, make sure that you get a hold of them at least 90 days in advance. Do not call them two weeks in advance, you know, Thanksgiving week, and ask if you can have a launch party in mid-December. Think, think it through. Give yourself at least two or three months to plan it. Okay. There is a couple of questions about 99 designs for book covers, and I tell you a couple ways that I've seen it work effectively. I, I haven't seen anything that I would say was stellar, um, really stellar, stellar that can beat with a full-blown cover designer. But it might be worthwhile to put something out there to get a bunch of ideas that come back that you can noodle, and then you could kind of select it down and then take it to a cover designer that could be competitive. Both Amy and I are very strong about your book is competing with a New York type book and we want your cover to have that effect. And Amy, you want to add to that? 
Are you there, Amy? I, I truthfully, Joan, you nailed it for me. That yes, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, I can. Yeah. Great. Just saying that you nailed it, but that 99 that, that these these less expensive uh, templated designs or 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 uh, um, vendor based designers just please pay attention to what your competition is doing and and make sure that your cover emulates what the best sellers in your marketplace is doing and that's critical so there's techniques certainly you can do with that and then uh, there are a couple of questions about uh, costs um, cost of everything. I just put up a link to a podcast I did totally on the cost and that you can reach into that and grab that. And uh, it's just a, a trails up. We've also, Kelly has posted all the links in a question a couple of times of every link that she posted because she did reel off a whole ton of them. And then someone else had asked about the cost per page for create space and my response back and you all should be aware it's it's a good idea good resource to create space and Ingram Spark and put all your specs in number of pages the size are you color are you just black are you matte or are you going to be doing glossy are you hard are you paper what are you and almost instantly you can get what a cost of one book costs so it, it's a good experiment to go through. And I, I think that kind of wraps it. I think we answered all the questions. Can you believe it? Is Are there any more? Oh, we have a few more coming in. Let's see. Um, someone said, if we, what if you don't have a launch party? Is it going to hurt a book? Uh, the answer is it depends. How are you going to do the shout outs and get it going? When we opened up, I was sharing about um, how one of, we, I have a launch of a book rolling out, a, a middle grade school rolling out tomorrow, and they have been number one hot new release on Amazon for over a week because all the pre stuff we have been doing. Pre launching could actually be getting your, your book up on Amazon and driving pre orders to there, and you get the buzz starting. So I, I think that you want to do something that gets the buzz rolling that you will continue to go off of it. Um, with that. Uh, Joan, there's a question from Angeline who wants to know how can we research the best-selling book in our nonfiction genre? Um, well, <laughs> there's two things. Uh, Amy, why don't you jump on this one? I, I just unmuted myself. The best-selling book in your genre is very easy to find by simply going on Amazon.com. Go to Amazon.com look along the top bar, the third word over from the left will say bestsellers. You click on bestsellers, you look down the left, you pick your category, dive down into your subcategory, and, and they will show you the bestsellers by rank. Amazon is selling almost 70% of the print books in this country every day right now. So if it's a bestseller on Amazon, it's a bestseller by category overall. The other way to check your bestsellers is there's something called, there's a, a wonderful list by category put out through IndieBound, through the Independent Booksellers Association, the ABA. If you're a fiction author or if you're really focused on the independent market, they come out with their bestsellers on a monthly basis. Make sure you go to the IndieBound.org website and check out their bestsellers by category. Right, you all should know about indie, IndieBound.org. It could be your best friend um, because they do chat it up. There, are, there is a mechanism where you can actually communicate and put out a blurb on your book to IndieBound bookstores, and they can contact you back saying, I'd like to review your book. You can send it to them, and uh, they, I, I will guarantee they're going to resell it but that it gives, number one, you capture their email address and you've got a real name of a person and you can pick up the phone and do a pitch, which I love. I think that's a great idea. So, uh, let's see. There's a question about the CIP program. Let's take two more questions. Um, the CIP program, Amy, not, accept, not accepting self-published works. I believe Amy said CIP does accept self-published works. Well, yes, this question actually was covered earlier that the Library of Congress will not accept 
uh, will not give you a an actual number unless you ha you are a publisher with four books by at least three authors. But you can go through third party verified vendors such as the Donahue Group or Unique Books or Quality, and they can, they are certified. They are allowed to to do CIP blocks for you. You can purchase them from them. They are not very expensive, and they're absolutely worth it. Okay. Please do not so. confuse. Please do not confuse a a catalog and publication block with a Library of Congress number. Those are two very different things. It, very different. And, and the and I'll, let me just give you a little tip. Once you have a book in hand, um, whether you send it electronically or you send the physical book in, I, I would make sure you officially get that completed book registered with the Library of Congress, which is different from an LCCN. Okay, Judith, we're going to have to wrap it up. Do you want to give are. us one final, uh, uh, just give tell us what to do <laughs> if we want to join Con the cruise? Contact me. So send me a text message or an email um, and the, or, or, or call me. It's evening time here now as we move into Colorado, but just take my number, 303-885-2207, or text me at that number, 303-885-2207. You can email me at judith at briles, B-R-I-L-E-S dot com. The, if, if you want to save $300, if you want to have a learning experience of a lifetime, if you want to meet amazing authors and, and create uh, connections, that we will be there to support you and encourage you. And let, trust me, all of us have such enormous outreaches in our contacts that when you're ready to launch your book, we're going to tell people that it's coming. Right. So and time, is, time is of the essence because we've yeah. only got what a couple cabins left we have a few cabins left um, I will go into overload to add on if need be if you need a different type of cabin or if you have uh, more in your uh, more than two in the room we have to do something about that call me and so you've got till the 30th which is just five days away to make this decision brainstorm questions, email them over, and we'll, you'll get them answered. So that's all I have to say, Joan. I'd love to see everybody on here, but it's going to be hard to bring it. 200 is not going to work. 300 is not going to work. But we can certainly get on a dozen or so if I need me. Right. Okay. So uh, copy down this phone number, 303-885. 2207 or make an appointment like ASAP if you can call her tonight to maybe call Judith tomorrow. Our cab the cabins may be gone by tomorrow. So um, you know if you're on the fence you better get off or the boat's gonna leave without you. <laughs> so thank you everybody uh, for being on the call. We uh, are recording this and we will get this rec the link for the recording out to you within 24 hours so you can sit and listen again to the 25 killer book publishing tips from the experts. So thanks everybody for being with us and um, we hope you can join us in January. Good night. Good night. Good night.